TV news in the Thai Tees region. Good evening and welcome to ITV News Thai Tees. Tonight's headlines. Punishments fit for the crime. Connor Brown's mother calls for tougher sentences after one of her son's killers is jailed again for hiding an on the run murderer. It hasn't led to any sentencing that is unduly lenient sentencing he's got from his part in Connor's death. He hasn't learned anything from it. And he's gone out and he's done something very, very similar. And it's just so. I'm just very disgusted that the justice system was going to be on that victim's family's down. Reinventing the steel, Teesside's once vibrant and vital industry returns in a clean and green way. Newcastle upon Rye, fresh from their foul, tempered and fiery win against Arsenal, Magpie fans fly out to face Borussia Dortmund. And we'll be taking a look at that famous sign that Christmas is nearly here. Yes, of course. Its First tonight, when will they learn? That's the message from Connor Brown's mother after one of her son's killers was jailed again for harboring another murderer. Ali Gordon was jailed for Connor's manslaughter in 2019. He served time in prison and was out on license when he helped hide another man was on the run from the police. Gordon admitted to the offence at an earlier hearing and today was jailed for three years and four months. Chris Jepson was following today's sentencing. Louis Whelan and Anthony Keating were jailed for life in January after being found guilty of murder. Their victim, 22-year-old Blaine Hammond from Sunderland. On the 3rd of December 2021, they beat him and dumped his body in a disused exchange box on Saltburn Road. Today, another man, Ali Gordon, has been sentenced to three years and four months in prison after admitting to harbouring killer Anthony Keating. When he committed the offence, Ali Gordon was on licence after serving time in prison in connection to the killing of Sunderland teenager Connor Brown in 2019. Brown, a promising boxer, was stabbed to death in a Sunderland alleyway near a pub after he tried to break up a fight. Leighton Barris was jailed for life for his murder, but Ali Gordon was handed a three and a half year sentence for his manslaughter. Connor Brown's mum, who now campaigns to raise awareness of the dangers of knife crime, says she's appalled that Gordon was allowed to commit this offence whilst under licence. I feel disgusted. I feel let down. I feel really sad for Blaine's family as well because, you know, as much as he didn't have a direct impact on the death of Blaine, he has had that impact on the family when they try to grieve for their son. And, you know, it's just caused more upset than when back to court and having to deal with Alice again. And it just caused more upset. But for me, he did this while he was still on licence for his part in Connor's death. He hasn't learnt. From his sentencing, by the unduly lenient sentencing he got from his part in Connor's death, he hasn't learned anything from it. She's not happy with the length that the sentence handed to Ali Gordon today. The police do a fabulous job there, but they're the ones that do all the work to get her to court. The lawyers all like to ask, but then it's the justice system behind. It's the sentencing behind. It's just not enough. Gordon will be punished again, but for Tanya Brown, he should never have been able to harbour another killer. Well, the court heard how this sentencing hearing was delayed because Ali Gordon had moved to Scotland after his licence period had ended, but it was his actions before that period had ended that was in question today. The court heard how Gordon had uh, given killer Anthony Keating a place to stay in Billingham when he was wanted by police. Keating was arrested two days later at that property, but when questioned in an interview, uh, Gordon was asked why he hadn't reported Keating to the police, and he replied, I don't grasp, he's a good friend. The judge said that this was misplaced.
placed loyalty to an old friend and that it showed a degree of immaturity. Now, the court also heard how Gordon had deleted call logs to try to protect himself from being uh, connected to assisting an offender and that he had lied when uh, asked about knowing the extent of uh, Keating's crime because phone records suggested he'd searched, it, searched for um, online news reports about the murder. There were also messages found on his phone that suggested Keating, that he knew uh, Keating was on the run from the police. One in particular stated, he's on the run like me. Gordon claimed that that meant that he was on the run from people in Sunderland like him, but the judge disagreed. So thank you for that update. Well, next tonight, and um, so the return of a once vibrant and vital industry on Teesop Steel. Yes, British Steel confirmed today that Teesworks in Redcar would be the location for one of their new electric arc furnaces. Around 250 people will make so-called green steel, named because the process is much cleaner than a traditional glass furnace. It's eight years since the collapse of SSI and with it the end of generations of traditional steel manufacturing. Today's news brings not only new jobs, but secures existing steel jobs across Teesside. Our industry correspondent Rachel Bullock has the story. It's now a year since the final remnant of Teesside's steel-making industry, its mighty thrust furnace, was reduced to rubble and rust. Twelve months later, a rebirth. Steel is in our blood, and being able to say that steel making is coming back is going to create more jobs, but it's also going to protect the almost 1,000 jobs we have with British Steel on Teesside as an incredible part of our journey that just shows it's not the end of the story for Teesside steel making. British Steel's new electric arc furnace will melt scrap metal into steel, which will be rolled at the firm's mills in nearby Lackenby and Skinning Grove. Lean and green. This is British Steel's announcement, isn't it? This is their money, this is their investment. You've just helped us along, isn't that the case? That's what I do. I mean, the role of there is to be able to bring investors to the region, make sure they can spend their money as wisely as possible. It's the future, right? So we're not just doing steel making and we're not lurching from one crisis to another. This investment is going to protect steel making in Teesside for decades to come. And politicians of all colours agree that this is what Teesside needs. Anna Turley was the MP for Red Car when the steelworks went bust in 2015. It's brilliant to have the, the steel still living and breathing on Teesside. It's part of the fabric, it's part of the DNA. And it's also wonderful to see the future of steel. This is green steel, this is modern steel. We've always said that it's, a, it's an industry of the future, not a sunset industry. So it's great to see steel part of that transition to net zero. And it's great that's happening on Teesside. Unions, though, are warning that electric arc furnaces are not a silver bullet, that they do not produce the same grade of steel as their blast furnace predecessors. Concerns dismissed today by industry experts. We have already four companies in the UK producing steel via the electric arc furnace method. They produce a variety of steel products, and certainly, let me reassure you, that all of the products that British Steel currently make and will make into the future can certainly be made by the electric arc furnace route. The electric furnace should be up and running here by late 2025. Rachel Bullock, ITV News, Teesside. And when a fire and rescue service says it saw a 15% drop in the number of deliberate fires this bonfire night, after a 94% increase last year, the service works with schools and police on a campaign to crack down on the problem. The organisation says it did experience pockets of antisocial behaviour this weekend, but no major disorder. The good news on the railways, train services in Northumberland have returned to normal as Percy Viaduct has reopened. Engineers have been working on the 170-year-old structure near Morford for the last month after damage to a power brick wall was found. Plans have been announced for a bid to establish a medical school at Teesside University. The Vice-Chancellor says the organisation is working with other bodies to prepare a case. He says the move would help to tackle health inequalities, including a lack of access to health care. Right then, one for the dads now. Quite literally, every parent, of course, wants to help their child do well at school. And now research suggests that dads could make all the difference. Yes, according to a new report,
sport, young children get better grades if their fathers read, draw and play with them. Catherine Walker has this report. The old saying is that education begins at home. And in Gateshead, sports coach Tom agrees that parents have a huge impact on their children's approach to learning. I'm the first person that a, like a child sees is a parent, a guardian. Um, so it's very important for them that they reciprocate or copy whatever they do. So it's very important for consolidating knowledge, say for example if they're having to do homework at home or anything of the sort, um, it gives them that sort of confidence to go to class and to be able to do it from there. It's no secret that parents play a huge role in children's development, but new research into father-mother households now shows performance at school is directly linked to dad's input. By studying test scores, researchers found children whose dads were involved when they were three did better in school by the time they were five. Children whose dads were involved when they were five also had better scores when they were seven. This research is suggesting that if fathers are just as involved and they share the house equally, this has positive implications for the father-child relationship and for children's educational development. The research, in collaboration with the Fathers Institute, recommends that dads take quality time to do interactive activities like reading and playing with their children. It's advice that gave fathers at this dad's club food for thought. We just need to normalise dads being an active part of, of raising kids. I think it makes perfect sense. My style of play is slightly different to where Nancy's mum's style of play, so she gets like a variation of both. But with 44% of households in the UK made up of non-traditional families, the single parent charity Gingerbread says more research is needed. This research focused on, on two parent households, um, but it hasn't looked at other means of support that um, families might have. Whatever the family makeup, the study teaches us that playtime is more than just a bit of fun. Catherine Walker, ITV News. There you go, Dad. Consider yourselves told. Now, the ITV Evening News continues at half past six. Coming up on the programme, the death toll passes 10,000 in Gaza after Israel carried out one of its heaviest bombardments overnight. Israeli military says it has now surrounded Gaza City, the country's media reporting soldiers will enter within 48 hours. Here, 2,000 jobs are on the brink as British Steel plans to close its blast furnaces in Scunthorpe. And a forever home for Fiona, the UK's loneliest sheep. Join me for those stories and more at 6.30. Zero Accounting Software. Sponsors ITV Regional Sports Report. Newcastle United are back on the Champions League trail this week after a tempestuous victory over Arsenal, Simon. Yes, Newcastle won on points. Arsenal tried to win on press releases. Nobody likes to lose, but nobody likes a bad loser either. This was a bad-tempered affair. Arsenal were lucky to keep 11 men on the pitch after a tackle on Sean Longstaff that was so late it could have turned the floodlights off and said goodnight. Bruno was lucky to dodge a red card for a cheap shot, and the winning goal caused a diplomatic incident. Anthony Gordon's tapping was subject to the mother of all VAR checks. As you'll hear, Arsenal boss Mikel Arteta wasn't happy, and yesterday the Gunners issued a statement backing their manager's comments. How the hell this goal uh, stand up and is incredible. I feel embarrassed, but I have to be the one now coming here to try to defend the club and please ask for help, because it's an absolute disgrace. Obviously, with every check that was going through, you're thinking, I'm probably going to find something wrong with it. Uh, very bizarre to have three VAR checks with the goals given, and that's all I know. I mean, Simon, if you're not an Arsenal fan, Arteta was almost amusing to watch, but why was he so angry? And more importantly, where does all this leave Newcastle in what, as you say, is a very big week? So. Yeah, I think it's great for Newcastle going into the Champions League week. Anytime you beat a heavyweight, it makes you think, well, maybe we're heavyweights as well. In terms of Arsenal, why was he so upset? Well, it's sour grapes, basically, isn't it? Look, Mikel Arteta settled down. 
Arsenal settled down. There must have been 10 teams this weekend who thought they got the wrong end of a decision, but not every one of them released a statement. It just, it's a bit moaning mini for my liking, that's all. Yep. Well, this time tomorrow night, the Magpies will be half an hour into their Champions League game away to Borussia Dortmund. The team flew out to Germany today and so did a lot of fans. These supporters travelled out from Newcastle Airport to Dusseldorf this morning. Dortmund's win at St James's Park 12 days ago means it is a key game, but the fans are certainly up for it. Well, I'm excited. We've had a great, great season, great last year. Everything's kept good, so the Jolly Boys are ready to rock and get from Germany. The win would be lovely. Well, it is what it is. We've got uh, Wembley again. Just, just two tops everywhere. Just it'll feel like Newcastle, like Wembley did. Excited, nervous, uh, first time, sort of first European trip as a dad and lad. Come on. Who you do it? Who you do it? It was like that over here, you know. And uh, we can get a result. No problem at all. On to the rest of the weekend action now. The dominant theme for the region's teams in both the championship and the first round of the FA Cup was what might it be? A game of musical chairs or musical goals, if you prefer, in Plymouth, where the home side shared six goals with Middlesbrough. This was proper my turn, your turn stuff. From the Borough perspective, 1-0 up became 2-1 down, then became 3-2 up, at which point they would have hoped to see the game through. But it wasn't to be 3 all at the end. Michael, a uh, really entertaining game, just got in really not to get the three points today. Yeah, the entertaining bit doesn't really interest me, to be honest. It's the, um, obviously the result in the end. I thought we played some really good stuff at times again and um, didn't get, in the end, what we deserved. I thought we deserved to win the game. Sutherland might have settled for a point at Swansea beforehand, but as they played an hour against ten men after Charlie Patino's red card, a goalless draw felt underwhelming. The Black Cats might have lost. They needed a penalty save from Anthony Patterson to keep the score sheet clean. What they didn't need was the Swansea woodwork to act as such a sturdy barrier to their hopes of an away win. You get frustrated because you're playing against 10 men, you expect to win, expect to score. The issues at the top end of the pitch I've talked about over the last few weeks, we do have some very inexperienced two strikers and um, they can't find the space in the box at the moment to score the goals that we need to score to win the football matches. In the FA Cup first round, Scarborough Athletic of National League North nearly marks their first ever first round tie with their first ever giant killing. But League Two Forest Green Rovers broke North Yorkshire Hearts with a stoppage time equaliser. The replays a week tomorrow. York City of the National League also replay on that date. They drew 0-0 away at Chester. Harrogate are through at the first time of asking. You might remember they're terrible at home and very good away. They were away to Marine, so they won. 5-1. Gateshead are out. Too little too late for them in Somerset. Marcus Dinanga scored a couple of late goals, but Yeovil were 3-0 up by then, and the ship had sailed. And Whitby Town from the Northern Premier League treated their fans to two great goals at Bristol Rovers. Nice. Unfortunately, the home side scored seven. It's a great fan, good fan too. They've probably more made a lot of noise. We've given some shout about on two occasions. I think they were all the lads have uh, put everything on the line for today. Just it was a it was the goal for the class. And I've, I've said to the lads, there's no point being down about it. If Scarborough get through, they're away to Blackpool in round two. If York get through, they're at home to Wigan. Harrogate are through, and they're away to Bolton Wanderers. In women's football, Sunderland were the dames of Derby Day. The Black Cats won the River Weir Derby against Durham at Maiden Castle. There was only one goal in it, and it was a good one. Katie Kitchen scored, scoring direct from a free kick. A good day for Newcastle United women in the Women's Premier League. They beat Stourbridge 5 0. The Magpies stay second and unbeat. Away from football, there might be a couple of bleak midwinters ahead. The Falcons are the only team in Rugby Union's Premiership without a win this season. The heavy defeat at Harlequins was their fourth loss in four games. And the Eagles have a European basketball game in Latvia tomorrow night. They're enjoying that adventure, but the home fires aren't burning. Newcastle lost at Leicester on Saturday. Now, if you weren't watching sport for the weekend, perhaps you were out looking for antiques because new figures show that more of us are getting involved in the antiques trade in the hope of making a quick bit of cash. You know, more and more like Del Boy just really has spent brilliant really up with hundreds of millions of pounds of potential treasure thought to be gathering dust in our homes. Our reporter Raheem Rashid has been looking at the lucrative ways you can find fortune that could be hidden in your furniture. 
We've all heard of cash in the attic, but might you quite literally be sitting under a gold mine? More of us are making money from antiques hidden in our homes in plain sight. In Newcastle, one dealer says technology and television are making the world of antiques more accessible. I think there's certainly a, uh, an awareness, you know, with TV programs, um, accessibility with you know, online platforms and shops like ours, which which have a big mixture of antiques, but also we kind of mix it up with uh, with more contemporary items and retro things. So um, I think they're just becoming more commonplace. Data from Google shows a 110% increase in searches for antique and furniture shops near me, while figures from Auction House show a 441% increase in the number of 18 to 24 year olds interested in online auctions. So if you're looking to make a little bit of money out of things that might be lying around your house, who better than to speak to Mark Francis Bandelli who joins us now. Now, you're a reality star on Made in Chelsea. No, no, no. Keep it on its knees until it knows everything about antique furniture and not to pee on the floor. So why don't you take us through some of the things that you might have lying around your house then that could be of value. What about glass is a really easy place to start because everyone has glass at home. And so often we forget to look underneath and looking for an acid etched mark. So here you can see very slightly Saint-Louis which is the leading French manufacturer. So what is better about buying antiques than brand new? Well, apart from the fact antiques are much more sustainable in a real sense, things used to be, generally, a lot better made. Something that is historical can generally be restored. And have you had any cases in recent weeks of people coming up to you that might have something of value, but it's actually turned out to be a hidden gem? Oh, yeah. A friend of mine took a photograph of a dinner gong of all things I know obscure, to say the very least. We put it in Google Lens, and it turned out there was one for sale for seven times the price. How much? It was 200 pounds and 1,800. So, while we may not all have a dinner gong and Cartier clock lying around in our living rooms, here's hoping you might now be able to turn something old into a little bit of gold. Raheem Rashid, ITV News. <laughs> now, we all know that Halloween has only just been and gone, but for some people, that means the countdown to Christmas is well and truly on. Yes, and up here, that's really cemented by the unveiling of a certain festive display. We can join Tom Barton in Newcastle City Centre with more. Tom, are you there, mate? Yes, mate. The first sign, like you say, that Christmas is around the corner is, of course, the Phoenix window display. Don't worry, they've not trapped me inside, but they did unveil this year's story last night, and it's trapped behind that animatronic wardrobe. That's this year, they're visiting Narnia, and one of the first people to have a look round today was 10-year-old Poppy, who really enjoyed her trip. I thought it was really good, and my favourite bit was, um, you know, like the hills over there with the rocks and like the flowers, and um, and where like the sleigh was and it was really good. Obviously you saw Santa Claus along there, the Phoenix window means that Christmas is nearly here. Does that make you extra excited? Yeah, it makes me extra excited because I really look forward to Christmas. And they've been doing this here at Phoenix for 52 years. One of the people behind it is Kieran, who uh, is one of the store's managers. Kieran, why do you keep on doing this? Well, as you say, we've done this for 52 years. Um, for us, it's really important to Fennec. But more important than that, we know how much it means to Newcastle, our community, uh, our customers, and, uh, and indeed, you know, the, the, the northeast, the wider region as well. Um, last night's sentiment across the globe. It's really important to so many people. Uh, and this year, it's Narnia. Why did you settle on that story for this year's display? Uh, so many different reasons and so many elements. As you can see tonight, it encompasses so many different things about Christmas. We have Father Christmas, we have snow, we have magic. Kieran, thank you so much. And the display, well, it's here until early January. Thank you. So I'll send you a message if you can pick me up a few bits. Thanks very much. Bye-bye now. Now, were you looking up yesterday? The skies were amazing as the Aurora Borealis came out in full force. We went up to Banbra and we caught up with one cameraman. In front of me we've got Bamber Lighthouse, uh, one of the best places for capturing the Northern Lights. I've literally just set up the camera.
camera and in front of me the sky is just completely green. Off to my left we've got some purples, uh, above me we've just had some reds. Uh, the forecast is just absolutely perfect. Normally we're covered in cloud but tonight we've got just a beautiful clear night and it's just perfect out there. Like I say, it is just completely green in front of me here. shots there and more here as well a very good evening to you and it certainly was a good evening for many people last night who did actually manage to capture the aurora borealis on camera it was seen widely across the uk even down as far south as kent and some were lucky enough to capture the steve effect strong thermal emission velocity enhancement effect and it is not very often that we see the aurora to this level across the uk so really thank you for sharing those pictures with us i always seem to miss the aurora borealis as we head into the rest of this evening of the overnight period well we've got a few showers just slipping across the pennines but largely dry enough of a breeze i think to limit any frost and fog formation just a little bit of hill fog but it could be a bit of a chilly night out there temperatures down to one to three celsius and then we're into Tuesday. I think there's going to be more showers around than there were today. Uh, they will be fairly light, though, and they'll blow through quite quickly. There will be some reasonable amounts of sunshine, too. So actually not a bad day and through the afternoon feeling fine. What it is, we've got an area of high pressure just pushing in from the west. And as it does so, it shunts the showers across further eastwards, and then they tend to slip away. So then we see quite a clear start to Tuesday night, a chilly start to the night to an early frost before this next system pushes through on Wednesday. This will bring a spell of wet and windy weather. It's moving through a little bit quicker than we thought it would yesterday. So for Wednesday, it's going to be wetter and windier earlier in the day, and that will clear through quite quickly west to east to sunny spells and showers through the afternoon, lighter winds, and then it's sunny spells and showers for Thursday and Friday, slightly heavier showers though on Thursday. Bye-bye. Tui sponsors ITV Tainty's Weather. Thanks, Emma. In just a moment, the national and international news. Better the light news at half past seven. Bye bye.